Great. So it's a real pleasure today to have Jennifer Listgarden from UC Berkeley give the lecture for CS159 Data Driven Algorithm Design. Uh, Jennifer is on the faculty at UC Berkeley where she works on machine learning, statistics, and computational biology. Over the last few years, she's probably most well known for her work on machine learning guided design for biochemistry applications, such as uh, CRISPR-Cas9 editing. More recently, she's been working on problems more motivated by protein engineering and small molecules, which is what she'll be talking about today. Take it away, Jennifer. Great, thanks. Uh, so there's already a chat. Oh, <laughs> is that, um, Zach? I just saw Z-A. I assume that's Zachary from uh, the Arnold Lab, but I don't they're, know. They're very excited you're here. Okay, um, I'm excited that they showed up. <laughs> Wait, this is so weird. I actually have never, you're not going to believe this, but I haven't yet given a presentation <laughs> on Zoom, so I'm just figuring this out. Okay, but how do I, right now, I, I guess I can only see my own screen or you guys are not going to. So, right, I'm going to mostly spend the time, I also, am I shooting for an hour? I don't remember, actually. Um, and you, then, like, you, you can do up to 90 minutes. Okay, so I, I kind of have designed, like, no pun intended, a roughly uh, just under an hour talk, but I do really like to get discussion and questions, and so please, uh, please do that. And this is meant to be a relatively self-contained talk, um, given some background, so, uh, so yeah, let's get started. And I'm going to just tell you a little bit about the flavor of some of my work overall before going into this sort of new area um, that I've jumped into recently of protein design with machine learning. So I actually spent uh, a solid maybe five years of my research life looking at problems in statistical genetics where you get, you can see my pointer, yes? Yes, we can. Okay, where you get, uh, so the DNA collected or like parts of the DNA that vary from a large set of people and you're trying to figure out which parts of the DNA are kind of causally implicated in disease so that you could potentially target drugs and things like this. And so from a machine learning or statistical perspective, these the modeling gets quite interesting because what happens is you don't end up with a sort of very clean data set of people which are say IID, identically and independently distributed, but in fact you often get people related by these hidden confounding factors like race and pedigree. And so it from a, from a methods uh, perspective, it makes the it very challenging and interesting on how to get around those both properly and also it turns out that to the extent you do it properly these become computationally extremely burdensome the complexity scales very badly with the number of individuals and so getting it to practically run is also quite interesting so uh, we yeah so there's a sort of a body of work around that and so the, I have mostly wrapped that up but we have one ongoing project that's um, from a postdoc, Paolo Casala, uh, who was at Microsoft when he started this. He's actually at Daphne Collar's startup company now uh, in Silico. Um, and so this is kind of an even more fun twist to that problem where instead of normally what people look at in these genome-wide association studies is they look at the, the endpoint, the trait, or in machine learning lingo, the like supervised target variable is a scalar, right? It's like you, what's your blood pressure? Maybe it's continuous or perhaps it's discrete. Like I have this kind of cancer or I don't. But in fact, there's a whole host of problems where it's much more interesting than that, where you kind of know the endpoint, but you don't really. So what do I mean? Imagine that um, there's people that have a disease and you have measured volumes of MRI of like their brain scans or their heart or something like this. And what you want to do is you want to do something similar to a standard genome wide decision study where you want to look at which factors in the genome, which nucleotides and which positions and which letters are causally influencing the thing of interest, which normally would be say the blood pressure. But here it's this huge image volume that sort of super high dimensional. And moreover, we don't actually know which parts of it we want to correlate with, right? You could kind of imagine some large omnibus test that's testing against the entire volume. But in fact, the way people do this now, because they don't know what else to do, is they actually go through and they handcraft features. They say, well, I'm going to get like a clinician to segment to this particular part of the heart. And then I'm going to, using some, um, some specialized image processing, I'm going to compute the volume of this area um, on, you know, across an average across the time slices. And now, now I have a scalar value and now I can use these standard methods that people are using. 
But what we said is, well, uh, in fact, you don't want to have to decide a priori which part of the volume and the image is the sort of interesting and important one. So perhaps we can automatically uh, learn that at the same time as learning which parts of the genetics are implicated. And so this is um, also very kind of fun and interesting methodologically, and, and we think also very useful because this kind of data is just starting to come online in larger quantities now. Um, and so this is a hybrid between actually a variational autoencoder, which you may have heard of from some of your machine learning courses, and what's called in statistical genetics a linear mixed model, which if you're a machine learning person, you can think of this as a Gaussian process regression with a linear kernel. Um, and these are, these are a workhorse of modern statistical genetics, always with a linear kernel, um, which is kind of a, a fun discussion to have with machine learning people. But so that's one project still going on there. And these are some very preliminary results from a while ago showing how it did pick up um, sort of hot spots in the image that do correlate um, to the genome. And we're kind of at the moment still going through and validating the method um, and we're getting together a manuscript. And so there's actually a version of the methodology that was published at NeurIPS um, in 2018. Although if you read it, you won't realize that it has anything to do with genetics because it's just the core machinery of the machine learning is in that. Um, and then one new direction since I arrived at Cal, uh, which is two and a half years ago, is I got pulled into this really fun project of machine learning for nanopore base calling. So, uh, so far in all these genetics, like back here, uh, like I'm showing you these pictures of ACTG, and the question is like, well, how do you actually get that, right? So some of you, okay, now I'm going to do a poll in the class, see who's paying attention. How do I even see? Who's done 23 in me? How do I, and how do I see the results? I have no idea. Yeah, let's see. So, uh Raise your hand, uh, if, uh, hit yes if you've done 23andMe and hit no if you have not, or just yes. Really, this is like, are you in the yeah, show? We're getting a bunch of no's, uh, not too many yeses. I see, okay, so, but everyone knows what 23andMe is, I presume it's, I guess we used to say it's a startup, although I think it's about 15 years old now. Um, and uh, and they and so they you can uh, spit basically you have to get a whole bunch of slide they'll put it in a tube you send it in right and then they tell you what you have an ACTG at like many many relevant places in the genome relevant to humanity in the sense that they differ across humanity and so the technologies to measure this ACTG for any given person have been getting rapidly rapidly cheaper and also just faster so right the first human genome took something like ten years. I think it is to assemble and now you can do this kind of like in hours. And so one of the most modern technologies that's really pushing the envelope here is something called nanopore, where you have this actually like protein core that you pull the DNA through. And as you pull it through, it generates a current. And so the game here from a machine learning perspective, at least, is to translate that current into these sequences. Um, and so that's actually like it's getting far along. It has a pretty high error rate. Um, some of the interesting sort of engineering challenges, they're trying to make um, solid state pores instead of protein pores, but that's not yet there. And the place that we've been pulled into is to ask, like, there's something called epigenetics, which are marks that are on the DNA. So here you just sort of see the double strand of DNA being pulled through. But sometimes people are interested in things called methylation marks, other sort of chemical things that sit on the DNA. And these methods that are meant to parse the signal into sequence don't know how to deal with that. In fact, it screws up just the calling of the letters themselves. And we would like to be able to properly read the letters in the context of these extra marks. And we would also like to read the marks themselves. And so that's um, with uh, actually Chloe, oops, I just added her name in here and I spelled it wrong. Chloe actually is a grad from Caltech, um, who's a grad student with me now and with Lawrence Hart. And uh, Brian and Uvel is the one leading the wet lab component of this. And so, and also Yisong mentioned this, um, that I did some work on CRISPR guide design. So this was back when I was at Microsoft in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I'm sure everyone here has heard of CRISPR um, by now, gene editing. So what you see here, how do I play it again? Play it again? Play it. Um, this big blob coming in. Oh, why is it not going? Interesting. If I go back a slide. And then back. So the big blob, this is Cas9, which is the enzyme that goes in. You see it's going to like basically like Pac-Man chomp on the double-stranded DNA and pull it apart. And once it's pulled it apart, it can also put a cut in the DNA. And the whole point here is you want specificity of this big Pac-Man, this Cas9. You want it to go to the right part of the genome to do its business. 
And it turns out that that's not necessarily the easiest thing to accomplish um, because it's a sort of stochastic process. It depends on the properties of the DNA there, how it's folded and all kinds of stuff. And so I'm, I'm not gonna go into detail, but again, just to give you a flavor of some of the interesting and, and impactful work one can do in computational biology. So here, this is kind of a standard supervised regression problem um, where you get, you get a very, very smart biologist who knows how to measure these things, which is extremely difficult. And basically what you do is for certain genes that you want the system to target, you try it in a bunch of places. And in this case, the goal was to just knock out that gene. Say, I don't want it to function, just cut it and disrupt it, which is actually a, it, not a toy task at all. This is very uh, broadly uh, useful. And then you go measure sort of how what effective was it when I when I use this template on the protein to go find the right part of the DNA. Um, so basically the, this works by complementarity of the sequence. And so you, you can basically try to learn the patterns that work well to be able to knock down a gene. And so there, of course there's a much longer story here and this is the very short version of it. And so actually this word now, this is a project that's been going on and off for a few years as um, people have been put on it part-time, but I knock on wood, we may have a submission this year um, with a bunch of people working on this right now. But actually, you know what, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this one. I can come back to it if it looks interesting to somebody. So right now I'm going to tell you, so basically around two, three years ago, I almost, I would say accidentally pivoted to this area of protein design, which I'm now completely enamored with. And I, this to me is one of the most exciting areas, both because I think it's the right time um, to start thinking about how to use machine learning and protein design because the right data is starting to come online because the right biotechnology is there. Um, and I think machine learning people are like, you know, it's a now a fairly mature and useful field and people know how to cross disciplines with it and do interesting things. Um, and so, uh, and so what, what I'm going to tell you, I don't have a long history in this. It's now about two years. And so mostly uh, we've been, we have started a bunch of collaborations, uh, which are very early stage. And a lot of what we've done so far is just thinking about the methods and the problems and talking to people. And so uh, we have some, uh, one preliminary paper out from ICML last year. Um, we're putting together some stuff now and there's, there's a whole bunch of related projects in the group. But I'm going to kind of just focus on painting the picture of how we think about this from a machine learning perspective and from some of the work we've done there and what kind of interesting problems I think remain that are extraordinarily difficult and different from standard machine learning. Um, so, okay, uh, one of the big things in proteins is actually, and I'm sure you've probably heard of like alpha fold and there's competitions every year of how do you take a linear amino acid sequence and make it fold into um, the structure that it would actually be when it's like behaving and working in the cell. So this is the famous green fluorescent protein, which is a uh, both a useful protein, but also a nice sort of canonical system to work with because it's very easy to measure fluorescence. So you can imagine if you're trying to design proteins, sometimes it's very tricky to measure the thing you actually care about because maybe it's happening inside the body in a particular cell type and so forth. But in this case, what this protein does is it actually, when it's in the right conformation, um, if it has the right sequence, uh, then it will fold in a particular way such that the very center has like this chromophore which fluoresces. And sometimes it fluoresces brighter, sometimes it fluoresces less brightly, sometimes it doesn't even fold and it doesn't fluoresce. Um, and you can also change the wavelength there. And so this is kind of a, a fun uh, protein to think about just in general for protein engineering in, in, as a as a system and we and there's some nice data sets out there to play with and so um so that's this guy here in this case this sort of fly has been uh, lit up with this green fluorescent protein and people have engineered the hell out of this to make it fluoresce more or at different wavelengths and but just to show you the sort of broad applicability of protein engineering i, I probably don't even have to tell you because protein well so as you, you may not know but pro like proteins are like the workhorse of you know the human body the animals and they're also prevalent in um, problems in agriculture so for example here rubisco is the most common protein on earth and it's involved in carbon fixation and there's very there's, i think there's only about 300 examples like variants of it available at the moment although we're working with a group here at cal that's um, developing technology to measure this in a very high throughput manner to change it and to try to engineer it and there's a tension between two properties you'd like it to have. And so um, if, you, this, if you could actually engineer it to be better than the existing ones, you, this could have a large impact on um, agriculture and the environment potentially. 
And then uh, a timely one right now, I guess, I didn't update these slides or I could have written COVID-19 like um, implications here, but we are working with people not for antibody and not for um, gene therapy, but um, just to actually to construct mini proteins that might target um, the, the place, the, this ACE2 that in the human body, uh, which is what takes up COVID-19, uh, as are many people in the world. But in general, antibodies are something that someone designs that um, sort of, uh, if they have the right structure, there's this like lock and key mechanism, then they can um, sort of uh, bind to something um, and prevent other things from binding to it and therefore act as a drug. And so people engineer these proteins. There's also, we're working with David Schaefer, also here at Cal, who does a lot of um, gene therapy uh, delivered by virus. So this is like a, a, a virus here. And what you do is you put in the thing you want, which they call a payload, uh, which might be the, the, the actual therapy, like a gene that does something like that. Say you're missing a particular gene, you put it in here, you throw it in. And uh, if you do everything right and you, uh, do a magic dance, then it might work. And But the idea is that you have to engineer this capsid, this sort of outside bit of this virus, so that it goes to the right cell type. Um, and so right now they do that with um, with directed evolution, a very high, um, high, which I'll explain in a minute. So, right, and then, right, and also I mentioned this example here of trying to bind Cas9 um, and to, trying to figure out which sequence to attach to the big Pac-Man so that it goes to the right spot. But actually people are also engineering this enzyme itself. They want the Pac-Man to have different properties, um, uh, say like to have better, uh, like side, no, fewer side effects and things like this. Uh, although that, that's a very big protein and it's in general, it's harder to, to engineer really big proteins other than by just fixing on a few um, relevant bits. Any questions so far? Just this sort of very intro. I can't actually see. So I'll just Please uh, raise your hand or type in chat if you have a question. What's that? I'm just telling the class. Mm. Okay, yeah. Right. Um, so, okay. Any questions? Okay, so what I'm gonna tell you is sort of a, a developing perspective of a machine learning person who's just made a foray into this area in the past couple of years. And actually, in fact, what happened the last time I gave, Yisong invited me to give a research talk at Caltech, and when I did, I actually had some chemists there um, approach me afterwards and said, the methods you're developing and the way you're thinking is actually very useful also for small molecule design. So we've been talking a lot to um, Michael Mazur, who's a, and to Sarah Reisman in the organic synthetic lab. Um, and so I'm not actually going to talk about the chemistry anymore. My running examples and narrative is going to be on proteins. But, uh, but I would say almost everything we're saying is in general applicable to this. Of course, once you drill down into a particular domain, you have to deal with all kinds of domain-specific problems as well. Um, and so in particular in chemistry um, and in the machine learning community, there's a lot of effort on just how do you represent a molecule in a way that's suitable for machine learning. Uh, and so, because machine learning, we know if you have enough data, then, you know, neural networks and variants of such approaches can, can tell you a good representation. However, what you may not realize is, is that before you get that good representation from the machine learning, you still need a good raw representation that's natural for the computer, right? Like in bits. And so an image is just sitting on a grid. You can easily turn it into a vector. A protein is a sequence that's linear. It's super easy to just turn that into a vector. But these have these graphical structures, right? And so you have to essentially um, kind of start going towards graph neural networks and graph representations. And that area is much less well developed developed within machine learning, although quite um, active right now. So that's kind of a very interesting opportunity as well. So, okay, but so protein design. So like it's, you can almost think of protein design as a problem of searching through in infinity, right? So here's the length of a protein. And given that you have um, 20 amino acids, um, how you, the number of possible proteins of that length, like just that you could put any, because it is true that you can put any letter there, and this is a, it, technically a valid protein. It may not do anything, it may not fold, but you could synthesize that sequence and it might it flop around and, and it might do something, but it is valid. So there's no sort of syntactical problem here. And so there's this sort of very, very vast space, right? So proteins are typically, in fact, much longer than 50 amino acids. And yet at the 50 amino acid mark, we're getting close to the number of atoms in the universe. 
And so this is just a ridiculous space. And so I guess um, this is how I, I ended up getting invited to your talk, because what we're going to have to do is sort of search through that space in a smart manner, which is um, kind of related to uh, various topics, I believe, in this course. So, OK, but before I go into how we're thinking about it, I want to ground it, uh, the, the computational methods I'm going to describe kind of, it turns out one can almost intuitively, after the fact, layer them on top of the way it's done right now. And so, the, I mean, there are different methods to, to protein engineering, but this is a very common one. It's probably especially common to all of you guys at Caltech, given that um, Francis Arnold got the Nobel Prize just uh, a couple of years ago. And so how does this work? And the people from her lab on the line, they can jump in and say, oh my God, you just dumbed this down too much. But uh, we're, well, it's computer science. We're allowed to do that. But so roughly what you do, and this is actually a really big potential bottleneck in, in uh, direct evolution, is you need a parent. Like you need some version of a protein. Imagine you're trying to get a protein to fluoresce, like really brightly at a particular wavelength. What you need is you need to have at least the essence of this property you desire in a parent, right? If it's not there at all, this basically will never work. And frankly, I'm not sure that any technique will work. So it's not like it's a limitation just to directed evolution, but uh, perhaps one day we can get around that. So you take some protein or a set of proteins, if you prefer, that have like some very um, minimal essence of this thing. And you want to basically figure out um, around the local landscape of that protein sequence, which sequences are going to be much, much better. And, and obviously this works because it got the Nobel Prize. And so how do you do that if from a laboratory setting? What you do is you take the parent or the set of parents and you induce um, mutations in them. Like, so we call the diversification step. So one parent becomes a pool of variants, each of which are kind of in the local um, sequence space around the parent. And so there's a number of different ways that you can do this diversification step. But for the most part, as a computer scientist, you can think of this as a random um, so think process, something like, let's say, roughly pick some number number of mutations at random, like, uh, although frequently they'll try to control it in a way where it's very few, or they're perhaps contiguous blocks. Um, so they, they structure it a little bit, but, but again, we can roughly think of this as, as random, where you pick a random number of mutations that, so it's just going to, and a, run, a random positions, and then a random, like, change from T to A kind of thing. And so now this is how you sort of now sprinkle the space around the parent. And now you need to measure the thing you care about or a proxy to it. And that can be extraordinarily difficult or relatively easy in the case of fluorescence. And then what you do is you're just going to, like, basically the, the, the title directed evolution almost tells you, right, like it's almost prescriptive enough to know what the algorithm is. And then you're going to take the top performing ones, let's say the top 10%, and then you're going to um, cycle through this. And now you have, so you're going to have a pool of things and you're going to keep inducing diversification. So that's the sense in which it's evolution and it's directed because you're telling it the property you care about, right? It's not just like the organism survived or not. It's like, I will let you survive if you do the thing I care about, which is perhaps like to fluoresce. And, um, and it's noteworthy to add that it's very difficult to deal with multiple properties in this. Um, and again, so that's also kind of an opportunity for computer scientists to perhaps come in and say, how can we do these things with uh, multiple properties? And as far as I know, the way people handle multiple properties now is they, they do it for one property, like maybe one or a few rounds, and then they just hope that that pool do, like a variance maintains that property. They've stopped screening on it and then they do the next property. So maybe they cycle back occasionally and things like this. So it's a little bit ad hoc. Please, if anyone's on there and knows better, please um, put up your hand and tell me the ways in which I'm wrong or you'd like to add something fun. Anyone? Uh, well, my understanding is that that's basically correct. Um. <laughs> okay, thank you. That was not what I was looking for. But, um, and I was looking for the wet lab people, but um, yeah. Okay, so right. So the kind of what we're trying to think of is like, how can we think of an in silico version of this? And so, um, and probably we're always going to need to measure things in the lab at some point, but it's, it's always um, a useful exercise to sort of say like, how far can we get like trying to just do it in silico? And I think at the end of the day, like most of um, machine learning and science is going to be like, you know, we're going to have to still measure things um, and, and get data because that's- uh, quick, quick, 
quick thing. Um, I think uh, many computer scientists aren't familiar with these terms like in silico, de novo, and these types of terms. Uh, in silico just means like in the computer, like com computational. Like, so the goal is to do computational directed evolution, given some amount of data that's been generated in the lab. And so perhaps in contrast to what you've been talking about at times in this class, we're not going to think in the context of a typical Bayesian optimization. So we're not thinking of like, what data do I acquire next? We're just going to assume that someone has already done a few rounds of directed evolution, that we could build some model with that data and then, and then report back what sequence should be um, produced like to like win the competition, you know, um, without collecting new data. So there's no kind of acquisition function here. It just says given a fixed amount of data, tell me the sequences that are my best bet for what I care about. Does that make sense? Okay, so right. So how do we go about sort of changing this into a computational or in silico problem? So the first obvious thing, if you know anything about machine learning is to say, well, someone gives me some of these data, like I can probably try to replace the screening procedure where I measure the fluorescence in the lab with a predictive model, right? So now I'm going to try to build a machine learning model that says, you tell me the sequence and I'm going to tell you what the fluorescence is. And then, so that would definitely make this a lot cheaper and faster, right? You just snap your fingers, run it through the neural network and you're good to go. Um, so I think that's not as interest, that's not the most interesting part of this problem because I would argue that at this point in time, building predictive models given sufficiently good data is kind of a commodity uh, at this point, right? Like, it, I mean, you could spend a whole PhD doing it in a very specialized way, but I think that if the signals in the data at this, like, like machine learning and the toolkits are so powerful that probably we can do that pretty easily or we can't do it at all, you know? Um, but I don't know that there's a lot of um, intellectually interesting things for machine learning methods development people there. Although feel free to yell at me and tell me um, you disagree. I'd be curious to hear. Um, but, and also, I mean, to be fair, I guess AlphaFold, which is DeepMind's um, prediction of structure, like they put a lot of stuff in there, although predicting structure is a little bit different than predicting a, a property, uh, and I would argue harder and more interesting. But. So I think the more interesting thing is to think about the process of how there's a divert, random sort of diversification step and then a selection procedure. So if you think about that part, what's happening in directed evolution is that this is a random greedy search, right? It's random because you kind of are randomly inducing mutations here. And you're not, you know, as a computer scientist, this may live in some low dimensional manifold that you're ignoring when you do this. Um, and and I, I know that people put domain knowledge in here, like structure and things like this, but again, like if you have data, it stands to reason that you can learn something about the space in which these things live and do something smarter than induce randomness here. And you may want to do something different than greedy. And in particular, in some sense, what you're doing is combinatorial optimization, right? It's, it's these discrete sequences and it's this huge space and we're essentially doing greedy random search. And so from a computer science perspective, this sounds like atrocious. Of course it works, the no there's a Nobel prize, so we shouldn't um, laugh too hard. <laughs> They're changing the world with this stuff, um, but it does seem like an opportunity. Okay, so, and that's kind of the, fo I guess, well, both of these together are, are the focus of what I'm gonna tell you about. So, uh, so protein property uh, prediction does have a, a reasonably long history. And typically the way it works is you um, build a model that goes from sequence to structure like AlphaFold um, and other, and David Baker's lab also does this at University of Washington are, are leaders in the field and pioneers in the field. And then from the structure, you go to the function. You say, well, given that I know the structure, let me predict, for example, the fluorescence intensity. Um, but in fact, increasingly what's happening is, and this first part of the problem, sequence of structure is very, very hard. Um, and although like you see it in science and stuff, it's actually at the moment still not very broadly reliable. And what's happening is people are starting to say, well, can we just actually bypass this if we have enough data and use machine learning? And so, uh, and I'm kind of at the moment, I'm agnostic to this. Like we're just going to assume for the purposes of this talk that someone has built a reasonably good model and, and we build them also from from data and we're not going to go through structure at the moment although if you need to do that then like that's fine we're not unhappy with that 
Um, and then we're going to, so we're going to now replace the, the measuring things in the experiment with this computational predictive model. And then we're going to replace the greedy random search with um, a sort of more intelligent search. And so, and that's maybe a, part, a big part of, of what I'm going to tell you about next. Uh, I cannot see the time. Okay, I see. So, okay, so how do we think of a normal predictive model, like something like, so this, like that goes from sequence to function, right? It might be a neural network, might be Gaussian process regression, could be so forth, vector machine, anything, but it goes from input and it tells you the predicted property. And the way you, the game is that someone gives you a set of the inputs and a set of the predicted properties, and you're gonna change these knobs such that it predicts well on the training data set, but not so well that it's fitting to the noise, right? That's the sort of standard thing. And we're gonna assume not that we need to train this, uh, of course we do sometimes in our collaborations, but like it's a starting point that we have this thing and the knobs, the parameters have been set. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to turn it on its head um, okay, wow, my neighbors just started sawing stuff. I don't know if that's interfering with the noise, but uh, tell me if there's a sound problem. So what we're going to do is assume this was given to us, and we're going to use it in this strange way where we're going to specify one or more properties, maybe that they need to be above some threshold, maybe that they need to be minimal, maybe that they need to be in a certain range, and then we're going to kind of invert the network and say which sequences correspond to those properties. And that's uh, at its heart kind of how we're thinking about this problem. And it seems actually kind of simple when you think about it that way. Um, but uh, in fact, there's a whole host of quite interesting problems that emerge. So uh, yeah, and one thing we're gonna, I guess in modern day machine learning, although probably not if Yisong teaches it, many people don't think much about the uncertainty in these models. You just think of a point prediction, right? I tell you like an image, you tell me, like, uh, like some, I don't know, like, it, there's not usually a lot of thought about the answer. I mean, there is some, but it's, it's going to um, be very, very important here, of course, because we're specifying these things. Um, and so we're going to need to know how certain the model is about them. Uh, okay, so now just again, I'm, I'm, the talk's a little bit repetitive just to make sure that you're staying with me on the narrative here. So, so here's again how we're thinking about this machine learning based protein design. We're going to assume we've been given the ability to predict a property from a sequence. Um, so for say the protein fluorescence from the DNA or the amino acid sequence. Um, we can be agnostic as to which of these it is. And so, sorry, I guess you guys probably all know um, the nucleotides, right, are ACTG. And it turns out there's a, a, a code, if you haven't taken biology or not in a while, that takes you from triplets of nucleotides. You can see all the little triplets over here. Um, oh, sorry, the triplets actually go this way. I'm doing it the wrong way. So like A, G, C gives you the amino acid S. And you can see actually that you can get the amino acid S also by A, G, T. There's two ways to do it. And so in general, triplets of nucleotides redundantly encode the amino acids. And we can design in either of these spaces. We can build predictive models in either or using both of them even. Um, but, but I'm not going to get into to pros and cons of that. But just this is essentially the input is a sequence of nucleotides or amino acids and the output is a scalar. Uh, again, in general, we can actually start to think in interesting ways about how to deal with multiple properties, but for the sake of this lecture, I'm gonna talk just about one property. And so that's the kind of input, if you will. And then we want a method that's gonna tell us what sequence, and actually we're gonna wanna hedge our bets. So we're gonna want a method that gives us a several sequences because the odds that we just get one that's right are pretty low. So a set of sequences that say maximize that property. And again, like whether it's maximize or minimize, like um, it's sort of, with, I can say without loss of generality, we'll just say maximize for the purposes of this talk. Although there, there are some nuances there as well. Um, okay, so that's the problem. And then we may want to add constraints when we're designing. So we may want to keep parts of the protein the same um, because we know somehow that they're really like, like we cannot change them for various reasons. Um, or it could even be that we don't want the amino acids to change at all, and we just want to change the choice of the nucleotides that code for it. This is sometimes called codon optimization. And, and again, there's another story as to why you might want to do that for both of these. Okay, so, and now I'm putting a black box around this because we, one thing we want is we want to be able to handle black box predictive models that have just been handed to us. And there's a number of reasons for that. So one is that there are many people in many areas that have spent decades developing models to predict proteins. 
and we just want to be able to like plug and play with anybody's models without necessarily having to poke inside, understand them, or compute um, gradients. And then, but more importantly, even if it wasn't black box and we knew the exact parametric form, we're taking we would be taking gradients with respect to a sequence, which is discrete, and so the gradient wouldn't be particularly useful anyhow. So it's not, in some sense, that's not a huge criterion. Are there any questions? I'm going to pause. Somebody ask a question. I'm going to refuse to go on until someone asks a question. Someone please ask a question. Or make a comment. You can say, I come from Francis Arnold Lab and I know better and this part's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody. I, I do. I mean, no one has a question. I have a question. Okay. Um, uh, how do you know that your uncertainty is calibrated? Yeah, um, so we're going to get there. Uh, I, so I, one of the first projects I had my new grad students do was actually like start looking a lot at the calibration of uncertainty. And I would say that that's, uh, I mean, the quick answer is that there are papers emerging on that. So, and I have the citations in the slide coming up, I believe. I would say it's not a completely well solved problem. And the, but more, well, we'll get to that because I don't want to have a spoiler. Um, so, but yeah. It's a very difficult problem indeed. Any any other questions? Okay, because now we'll kind of get into the details of the statistical and machine learning approaches of to solve this this problem. Okay, so some of the goals that we have in this is, as I said, we want that we, we're going to call that model that's given to us the predictive model of black, uh, on the oracles. When I say the oracle, I think that's the thing that's replacing the laboratory experiment that measures it, it's our predictive model. And we want it to, we want to um, have a design algorithm that allows it to be black box. And we want to uncount for uncertainty of the oracle. And we'll talk more about um, that uncertainty. And then, right, we want to, I mentioned this, provide a good, a set, a set of good candidates, not just one. Um, and so after quite some thought, we came up, David, um, who is my first PhD student, uh, came up with this uh, idea independently, it turns out, and then we found a very rich set of literature, actually many sets of literature, most of which don't know about each other, um, uh, call, which we call model-based optimization. And in fact, this is used a lot in operation um, research. It's used in reinforcement learning when you have stochastic policies. Uh, it's, it's used in a, a number of places. Oops, and so let me say what I mean. What do I mean when I say we're doing model-based optimization? So normally when you think of optimization, you think I have some function. So maybe this is like the fluorescence of the protein. Um, X is the sequence of the protein. And the game is to find the X that maximizes this, right? Like that's just the standard setup. Um, so when I say model-based optimization, what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace this formulation of the problem with another one. And under some conditions, these are equivalent. So what is it? And if you haven't seen this, it's maybe a little bit strange. And you might think, like, why? <laughs> why am I doing this? Does this make sense? But I assure you that if it doesn't make sense as I'm giving this talk, if you go sleep on it, you'll realize it, it makes a lot of sense. So instead of searching through the sequence, I'm going to search over a uh, uh, distribution over sequences, like a, a gen, it could be a generative model, right? So this could be like an HMM, hidden Markov model. This could be a variational autoencoder that generates discrete sequences. Um, and so instead of finding the one sequence, I'm going to look for a distribution over sequences. And, um, and then I'm going to look for the distribution that in expectation maximizes the thing I care about. And so now I've gone from searching over X to searching over theta. Um, and, and that has a number of kind of interesting, con oh, well, and let me say, like, when are these equivalent? Does anyone know? Can someone tell me a condition under which these are equivalent? <laughs> Am I allowed to answer? No. <laughs> when I ask questions, they're not for you. you there is a, there, by the way, there is a question uh, from the okay. audience, uh, which is slightly unrelated, which is, uh, what does it mean for uncertainty to be calibrated? Which you can. Yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, uh, to, for uncertainty to be calibrated, imagine you have a classifier for cats and dogs, and the classifier says that you give it a picture of a cat, and it tells you that this is with 0.8 probability this is a cat, and with 0.2 it's a dog. So what that means is that uh, if you actually give it a, a cat, that like so for all the things that get a 0.8, 80% of them precisely better be a cat, and 20% had better not be a cat. 
So it's sort of actually telling you in expectation over all the examples, like how, that, that, like that's the kind of the exact just definition of the probability, right? Does, I don't know, does that make sense to whoever asked that? Yeah, like weather forecasting for like 20% chance of rain. Um, there's a 20%, if you look at all the days where they say it's a 20% chance of rain, 20% of those days should be raining. Right. And otherwise it's meaningless, right? Like, cause like, why else would you have said 20%? Yeah. And so it's very easy to think about calibration for classification. Is it going to rain or not? Is it a cat or not? And, but you, there are analogs also for regression. So regression, you have to think of like kind of confidence intervals around the real value. And then you say like, do does, if the 95% confidence interval is this, then it has to be the 95% of the time it lies in that region. Kind of. So it's, it's, it's directly analogous. Um, okay, so back to the model-based optimization though. So the game is to, um, right, so when are these equivalent? So it's equivalent basically if this model, this P of X, if I parameterize this in a way that it's high capacity, um, or I mean, if I just in theoretically pen and paper, if it's arbitrary capacity, um, then if I put a delta function, I make it a delta function on the particular X that is maximal, then you can see these are just one and the same because then it collapses to that. So, um, but in practice, we're gonna have to pick a class of models to implement this with, and they may not be high enough capacity. Although I think for all the ones we're doing, they probably can put a point mass on anything. Um, whether they do, I'm not sure. So, and I should say, there's a lot to think about here about when we do this, and on a practical application, what class of model is appropriate here. And so I don't have any of that. We have some thoughts on that um, that are not published, um, but I'm not going to talk about that again here. I'm just going to say, let's suppose we have that we've decided we're going to use a variational autoencoder um, and then go forward from there. Okay, any questions about this? Because this is going to be the framework we use to solve this sort of in, um, computational directed evolution. Um, so, but why do people generally do this? Like we, we, uh, you know, we thought David had come up with this, but it turns out that like, actually there's a, a lot of places, but, um, so here are just some nice reasons that, that we came up with it is the model can sample broad areas of sequence space. And so one way you can think about it is this, this probability distribution. Sometimes I like to explain this sometimes as though X were continuous because you can then like, just think of this as like a Gaussian spotlight on the space that you're trying to design in. And kind of that spotlight is gonna move around with an iterative algorithm, hopefully going towards the part of the space that contains the maximum. And so, and it's always kind of surveying a local region of the space dictated by the variance of that Gaussian. And of course in discrete space, there's an analog of that. I just find it a bit harder to visualize. But so that's what I mean by it can sample broad areas of sequence space. And it does not require gradients of F so if you take this as your objective as a, uh, to do maximization and you take the gradient, then for those of you who have seen um, any reinforcement learning and you may have heard of the reinforce algorithm, you know that when you take the gradient of this, it does not require the gradient of that because that's just how it works out, even if that's counterintuitive. Um, and I, in fact, I think Ben Blog has a, a nice rant somewhere about why that's really, why you should never do these things. <laughs> Um, it also, we can also incorporate uncertainty. So here I've just written a deterministic function, but in fact, this can be the CDF, the cumulative density function of our probabilistic regression model and thereby account for uncertainty, um, whether it be homoscedastic or heteroscedastic. And because we're, the end game here is that we're gonna find one value of theta, which determines the distribution. So that's how we're gonna get a set of candidates. Um, and I think the really nice one though, so that we actually didn't completely fully appreciate at first, and we'll get to this a bit later, is that I, and I think this is quite fascinating, is I've gone from a, a problem that has no notion of probability to a problem that does have the language of probability. And now if you want to start um, doing things, say, in a Bayesian manner, you want to bring in domain knowledge in a rigorous probabilistic manner, uh, empirical Bayes or however you choose to do it, you now have the language of probability here. And I think that's extremely powerful. Um, and, and we're gonna leverage that, in fact, um, in a little bit, but you won't see it at first. Okay, any, again, any questions on why we can go from here to here? Um, I have a question. Um, mm -hmm you're just implicitly assuming that sampling batches will naturally diversify? 
So when you say oh, you can actually, control- yeah, sorry. I guess actually, if you run, if this has a high enough capacity and you run it sufficiently long, it will actually collapse to a delta. But in practice, we don't run it to that. And you can also choose to sort of say, um, like regularize in a manner that that also gives it more diversity. Um, but I guess you're like, you're right. In some conditions, this will collapse to a deterministic um, delta function, but at least you now have the option of saying, well, I'm going to tweak it in this way or that way to make sure that it's not a degenerate um, point mass. So I guess if you were to be really probabilistic, um, you could do a hierarchical Bayesian approach where the prior, you have a prior over thetas and you sample the theta. So even if P, if P of X given theta is high, yeah. capacity, you get diversity. If, if I'm going to be I don't yeah. want to take that sort of non-parametric Bayesian approach. I mean, I think the that's just an that's analogous to regularizing, right? I guess. Yes, I um, so. Yeah. The, the sort of the one, yeah. just a different viewpoint of how you do it. Like, if you added a minimum um, entropy here, yeah. uh, that probably corresponds to some prior and a hierarchical Bayesian yeah. approach. Um, yeah. Right. Was there a, was there another question? Did someone raise their hand? No. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So, okay. So now what we've said is we, we're going to, we've changed our objective and this is what I've, what I'm, we call this design by adaptive sampling. And this is the precursor to what we ended up publishing. And the reason I'm telling you about it is like, cause it's our thought process and the other one builds on this. Um, so if you understand the basic mechanisms here, it'll be easier to understand the other one. And so now this is now the CDF of our predictive model where S is like a set of values because we've integrated over a set of like fluorescence values. And so in the sort of, which might be a bit, you can think of this as like all fluorescence above some threshold, for example. Um, and then it gets a bit weird if you think about all fluorescence above the maximum threshold, but like you can also think of it this way. So this is the set of desired properties given a sequence and you want to find the theta that maximizes this. And so we call this like our model based optimization objective. And so um, as I've said, we, what we used is a VAE here, uh, which of course you cannot, if you know, you may know you can't compute the exact um, likelihoods and you have to deal with a variational elbow and things like this, but um, but you could, you have an HMM, you could have a mixture of multinomials. So again, like what I'm describing is agnostic to that, although the experiments um, used a VAE. And so, and this is this sort of like, right, again, like you can think of this as this spotlight that's going to search around the space um, and hopefully smarter than what directed evolution would do by understanding the properties of the space, because it can start to understand notions of manifold and things like this. Um, right, and that's the desired set of property values, something like fluorescence above a threshold. And uh, this is this, oh, I, I guess I, I, I've got ahead of myself, right? This is the stochastic oracle, um, and it's, it's actually the CDF that accounts for the uncertainty. And right, I haven't yet said, like, how do I know it's calibrated or anything like this, but let's assume it is. So um, from a technical machine learning perspective, uh, how do we solve this? Uh, so this looks a little bit, it maps to a number of problems in, in machine learning, but the main issue, you, if you're familiar with these, is that I'm trying to do an optimization over theta, and theta appears in the distribution in the expectation, which makes it super tricky because it's like uh, to, to deal with. And so there, there are different ways people deal with this. Um, so in the variational autoencoder, for example, they use the reparameterization trick. Um, and what we do is we actually maximize a lower bound um, we turn it into an iterative algorithm where um, now this theta here is fixed and we're searching over only this one. And so I, I didn't put the details here because that would be a bit much, but it is all in the paper. And in fact, um, if you're familiar with expectation maximization, uh, we actually have a paper out that shows, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself, but there's an exact equivalence with, ex with Monte Carlo um, expectation maximization here. And what that means is the bound gets satiated. Um, but again, like, I, I guess either you understood what I just said or you didn't, it's fine if you didn't, just for those who, who know these things. Um, but we can, that's one thing we do. But the other, and that, this one is a pretty standard, like, um, problem to have to deal with in machine learning. The second one is not. And this is one of the reasons design becomes kind of very interesting. Um, this one example of where it gets interesting is that I now have a Monte Carlo estimate um, on which of this thing, because I'm going to draw samples to compute it. It's not going to be analytical. And then from those samples, I'm going to try to find the data that maximizes them. 
And so you have to be careful when you have a Monte Carlo estimate that the variance of that Monte Carlo estimate is not too high. And what makes it high is essentially like our, the kind of the effective number of samples you have in that Monte Carlo estimate. And here, if this term wasn't here, then the number of samples would just be the kind of the number of samples going into this. But here, this is the probability that any of the samples I have in my hand right now satisfy the property I care about. And by construction, like in the case of like the fluorescence problem, I'm starting off where very few of them do, or they barely do. And so this is gonna be really, really low. It's gonna be close to zero. And what that means is that I have a crazy high variance Monte Carlo estimate that's essentially useless. And so there, it turns out there's some related literature from which that we could draw on. Um, and and it, it, it sounds very simple, but it's actually pretty interesting when you get into the details of it. But ultimately what we're gonna do is we're gonna have an iterative algorithm that does a, kneels a sequence of relaxations on that set of properties. And so for example, we might say, instead of making it super strict, like the fluorescence has to be really, really high, we might just say the fluorescence has to be higher than the median of what we've seen so far. And so that's the sense in which we relax this. And when we relax it, the Monte Carlo estimate has a lower variance and is more useful. And then as we move closer and closer to where we want to be, we can correspondingly um, put this back to where it should be um, very slowly. And so that's, that's how we deal with that. And this is related to a class of algorithms called the cross entropy method, actually. Um, okay, so then the neat, the thing that I always love about this is what I described is how we thought about this as machine learning people. And then when we looked and thought about the algorithm, we realized that it kind of mapped very nicely to actually what directed evolution is doing. It's almost like instead of going through the development I just went through, it seems as though in retrospect that we took directed evolution and just like did the most obvious thing computationally for each step. And so let me explain what I mean by that. So this is a procedure header. And this is for the, um, the first version of the algorithm designed by adaptive sampling. And so as input, we, as I said, it requires this Oracle and we want to deal with the uncertainty. So we also want to have um, access to its CDF. So integrated above um, gamma. Uh, and then we require a generative model training procedure. So maybe this says you give me a set of X's and weights. So we have to be able to take weighted examples and then you train, for example, variational autoencoder and you give it back to me. That's what this is. Um, these are some auxiliary parameters that it's not overly sensitive to and won't discuss. And then you, this is like the parent um, in directed evolution. It says like, which proteins should I start with? And in principle here, you can start with none. Um, like whether in practice that works is like a, a different story, but at least you can. And I could imagine scenarios in which that might get you somewhere. Okay, so that's the, the header. Um, and now, so right, so here's, I'm gonna just go step you through. Can I, the, can I interrupt you just very yeah, briefly? Um, yeah. So uh, I, I think this abstraction makes sense because you're assuming access to this Oracle that was in, in, in often trained from a, a data set of useful yeah. proteins. Yes. And so in some sense, the fact that you have an initial parent is implied by the fact you have a Yeah, parent. yeah. Hopefully, unless you have a really bad predictive model, yes. I, but I agree, I totally agree with that. Whereas in like sort of the canonical uh, direct evolution paradigm, this oracle, uh, that this 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 uh, computational model is sort of either very naive or it's uh, in, based on like intuition, some set of intuitions. In which case, having this initial condition means that this oracle doesn't exist. Yeah, or is not or is not explicit. I mean, in some sense, you can view that this as like, I mean, right, it's not even necessarily like, we're not trying to beat directed evolution. So it's not like, oh, do this instead. Like, and in some sense, what we're saying is someone had to have already done something like directed evolution. It doesn't have to be direct evolution, but have generated some data to bootstrap us in, right? And directed evolution is just saying, no, you just give me one parent. So it's not like an apples to apples exactly. Right. I guess, I guess my, my, my observation, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that there's this, this abstraction uh, has an, this implicit trade-off between the strength of the oracle and the and the and the strength of the initial starting point. Say that once more. It has. It has. Um, so at, at least, in, if we want to were to instantiate this in practice, yeah. Um, there is the how good your oracle is mm -hmm. versus how good your initial starting point is. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Um, well, I don't know about versus. I mean, ideally, you want them to both be good sure but I've, if, I, if i were to think of traditional uh uh directed evolution the oracle doesn't exist 
Well, yeah, it, I mean, it, it does in that it's a wet lab that doesn't sure. yeah. information, <laughs> right? But like, yeah, that is the Oracle. But yeah, no, you I'm with you. Really strong, I mean, you need really strong initial parents. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. I agree. Yeah. Um, and so, okay, so back to the mapping. So basically the mapping is to get the parent, we initialize it or we initialize at random if we don't have a parent. And we could have several parents and we're just going to, at the beginning, set their weights all equal to be uniform um, and, and one. And now we're gonna, just as directed evolution cycles through, we're gonna go into a while loop and cycle through. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the initial set of parents and the way we're gonna do diversification is in a way that is intended to make sense and to leverage this whatever sort of manifold structure might be lying in this um, space that directed evolution doesn't really get to look at unless it's injected with very specific handcrafted knowledge. And so what I mean is we're gonna take the starting set of, of sequences and their weights, and we're gonna train a generative model. And so if it does, if that's an appropriate generative model with appropriate model selection, it has a hope of understanding something about the space. And that's, that's I mean, that's always the goal with a generative model like this, and it is the goal here um, set into a larger context. And now rather than this sort of diversification step here, are going to sample from the generative model. And so again, like just to highlight the point here is that if that generative model has somehow learned something interesting about the space, then when we sample from it, it's going to sample in, in a way that's more effective for us to search through the space. And so on an intuitive level, like what I mean by that is imagine, so proteins actually, it's known that sometimes if you make a single point mutation to a protein, then it completely screws up the structure and the whole thing doesn't fold. Like they're kind of, they can be very brittle. However, it's, it's sometimes the case that if you allow it to make a second mutation to compensate for the first one, then it has some hope to recover. And so what you find if you look at real proteins is that there's many pairs of um, along the sequence, not contiguous, but uh, in very dis, um, far away places that are correlated with each other. And if you ignore that property and you sample, um, then you're gonna get a whole bunch of samples that don't fold and aren't any good. Whereas if you're aware of that property and you sample in a manner that's adherent to it, then you have more um, likely, um, you're gonna probably get a better bang for your buck on the samples you pick because they're not gonna just collapse the protein. Hopefully that makes sense. Cause I think that's one of the key points here as opposed to what's actually happening in directed evolution. Um, and so that's the diversification step. And then I'm not going to go into the details here, but instead of screening it in the lab, we're going to call the Oracle and we're going to call it in a way that makes use of the uncertainty there. But in, at the moment, we're assuming that uncertainty is correct. Um, and it is a good question to say, what if it's not correct? But let's say it is. And so, in fact, when we first did this project, we, were, we got really obsessed with calibration of uncertainty because it was so important because it was an assumption here. And so we spent months looking at this literature and so on and so forth. And I'll tell you the upshot of that. Um, but so, right, so, and then we cycle through. And so I, I have to say, to me, it just was super exciting that I could tell this story overlaid on this plot of directed evolution, even though it's not at all how we um, came up with the algorithm. And that's just sort of very deeply satisfying and fun and makes it fun to talk about. Um, okay, any questions again? Um, okay, because of the pandemic- oh, there's, a, there's a question. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, please ask your question, unmute yourself, yeah. Should I just talk? Yeah. Hi, yeah. this, this is Bruce, I, I'm in the Arnold lab. Um, ah. I think my major questions, and you might actually be getting to this, um, but so when we're working in the lab, we typically consider ourselves lucky for a from a machine learning perspective if we have any more than 300 data points. Yes, I, I know this. Lot, yeah. Yes. We yes. don't have a lot of data to work with. So my question is, how much data do you need for this to work? I mean, uh, I, I love see, this. I love this question. Yeah, um, the VAE, right? You, there's a lot of unlabeled data you can train a VAE on, but the Oracle, yeah. I'm assuming you need labeled data still. Yeah, so there's so many, there's, I have to, I have never been so excited by my research as I have been since I started working on it. So there's so many, like I could talk for an hour just in re response to this question, but I, okay. I cannot do that. But so, um, I mean, so one quick answer is that like, in fact, uh, you guys or some folks there, I think Zach, I think it's Zachary spoke to you on the phone and at some point Kevin Yang had visited and like, right, we, uh, we were excited that potentially we could work together. And then I, you guys said, well, we have like 300 examples. I said, okay, come back to me in five years. 
when your technologies change. Um, and so I, that is very tricky. I know you guys are playing, um, uh, or play, do, using, sorry, I don't know, not to, um, using machine learning, but I think it is extremely limited, right? Because to right. The, like all these comments I've made do assume some um, amount of data such that you could learn these things. And I think that will be very, very tricky in the okay. scenario of 300. So we have collaborators who generate 10 to the six variants. Um, because they ha are doing different proteins with different technologies. So right. um, although you, we can't really do this with your data, we can do it with their data. And then there are these very interesting papers coming out, um, that, like, well, one in particular, and I'm, I, that my lab, we're, we're um, very actively, uh, let's say, poking into and, and understanding, uh, I think, better than the authors of the paper themselves. There's a very intriguing paper by the church group, this low-end protein engineering mm -hmm. paper. And it feels like they've done something there. And, uh, and, and I think there's a lot to be learned there, but like just very briefly for people who don't know that paper, which is probably most people here, what this paper purports to show is that by leveraging a large amount of unsupervised data, much like they do in NLP with these BERT models and things like this, they, uh, by analogy, they take a huge like dump from of like 30 million, I, I can't remember, something like this, proteins with no label, and they build a representation model as one would in NLP. And then they show with that, that they can build a good and useful predictive oracle with only 20 data points that are labeled. Um, and so actually, if you guys in the, in the Arnold lab are interested in, in that direction, like um, this is something we're like spending a lot of time thinking about. So, but I guess that's pretty tangential to this class. So I'm not gonna <laughs> say any more, but that's another thing is like to what extent and in what ways can we leverage unsupervised learning to help in this low N regime? Um, also, yeah. And then as for, so that was one, so I answer, I'm gonna answer three ways. One is there are areas where we don't have that problem, so yay. Two, when you have that problem, there's some intriguing work out now that suggests perhaps you might be able to get around it. And it relies on homology searches. It, re it requires that the protein you're looking at has like a lot of things similar to it in the, in the databases. But the third question you asked was, and how do I know? And so actually David Brooks, who's the first author on this paper, has become obsessed with essentially power calculations for directed evolution. So saying like, suppose that the diversification step is induced in, and sorry, it's hard because I'm trying to talk to you guys who know this stuff and then I guess much of the class doesn't know these terms, but one way people do diversification is with some, with, is they introduce um, a copying error mechanism into, or it exists and they make it even higher than what it is. And so you could say like, given certain properties of my diversification step, um, and certain um, basic assumptions about the complexity of the oracle, how many points do I need to be useful? So this is actually something David's trying to formalize now is essentially power calculations for different kinds of diversification for directed evolution. So the, the, that's still work in progress though. Um, sorry, that was a long side track. Does that, does that help a bit? Yeah, no, that, that's good, thank you. Okay. Um, and if you guys are, again, if you guys are interested in talking to us, I mean, that we'd love to, to talk to you guys. So, uh, okay, it's too bad I'm not actually down there in person. So, okay, so, right. And so the, the other thing that like got me so excited about this area um, from a machine learning perspective is that David basically reinvented what are called estimation of distribution algorithms, which are also without their knowing it, most people in reinforcement learning are, are actually using these if they have stochastic, stochastic policies. Um, uh, and so these are kind of interesting because they're like the modern day version of what we used to call evolutionary algorithms. Who, who on the, okay, let's do a show of hands. You guys know how to, did you teach them how to use Zoom to do show of hands? Uh, yeah, people, um, yep, I'm looking at show of hands, yep. So who's, who's heard of evolutionary algorithms? Sh show of hands, if you've heard of evolutionary algorithms, we have, um, uh, substantial right. fraction. Substantial fraction. All right. Okay. Yeah. Now I have a follow-up question. Who was taught that if you use one, they would kick you out of the institution you were in? Um, Nobody. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's cool. So, so when I grew up in school, like these were mocked by the machine learning people as some ad hoc nonsense. Um, and however, I, I now realize that these have been very successfully used 
even though they are slightly ad hoc nonsense. And I guess computer scientists like to pride themselves on clean, coherent stuff, which is indeed nice, but often actually to get it working, it is a little bit of magic sauce as well, and we pretend that it's not. So maybe um, we shouldn't so hastily judge. But so, right, these evolutionary algorithms are optimization algorithms that have this analogy to evolution. And the analogy, so you start off like, like let's think of that argmax of x uh, over f of x, just a regular uh, optimization problem. And so what you do is you basically posit a set of mutations, in, I put in quotes, which means like the mutation might be, I'm willing to change the sequence I have by mutating it once or twice at random. Actually kind of like what happens in directed evolution, but you do this in the computer. You just dictate the kinds of moves, stochastic moves that are allowed. And then from this dictionary of stochastic moves, you basically move around a set of sequences and then you evaluate them according to your um, oracle and you keep moving around in this way. So this is actually a lot like what I described and it's also a lot like directed evolution. So what like, so, but the difference is that just like directed evolution is you've just in some ad hoc way made up the moves. Whereas what happens in these modern day versions of these EDAs is the generative model is telling you how to make smart moves. And that's kind of the main difference between these. And it's why like some people, myself included, call these the modern day equivalent of evolutionary algorithms. And I think they're kind of much more principled and powerful. And this is related to some other, so there's so many really interesting ties to literature here, but I guess I won't go into all of it, but um, do I have, uh, why is this not working? Oh, there. And yeah, and actually we have this, um, this is actually just accepted as a poster at, uh, at an evolutionary algorithm conference, but we show that um, the ED, a certain class of these algorithms is exactly Monte Carlo expectation maximization, which has not been shown before and I think is quite interesting. Um, okay, and then as I said, it has ties to reinforcement learning. And also for those of you who do any um, vision or image generation, it turns out that all these techniques I just mentioned are also related and relevant to, imagine if you uh, a class of, of images and you um, build a generative model, and now you wanna generate an image, say like of a woman with glasses on. So you condition on the fact that the woman had glasses and you say, show me that image. It turns out that's a lot like protein design from a machine learning perspective. Um, and so there's very interesting connections and synergies there as well. And actually there's so much synergy with reinforcement learning that in fact, my colleague, Sergey Levine, who's very deep into reinforcement learning, and I are now like actually collaborating and writing grants and brainstorming, which uh, was very surprising to me. Um, okay, so great. So, but what could go wrong? I just described this beautiful work. It's a great story. Who can tell me what can go wrong other than Nissan? <laughs> Okay, so, I mean, basically, Isan already pointed it out, is we assume that the Oracle is unbiased and has good uncertainty estimates. And so we thought that if we really like use the most up-to-date, state-of-the-art uncertainty um, estimates that we would be okay. But it turns out that you can never be okay because no matter how good your uncertainty estimation is, it can never be, um, you cannot have calibrated uncertainty if the model, the Oracle, is biased. And biased means that like basically in, you know, in expectation, it's wrong. And when you get further away from the training data, whenever you draw these plots with Gaussian process, it always looks like it's well behaved. But in fact, you can basically guarantee that far away from the training data, it's not going, it's going to be a biased model. It's not going to give good predictions and, and it therefore will not give good uncertainty. And one way to think about that is like the point prediction is usually like the, the mean value of the distribution, right? The predictive distribution. And to the extent that that mean is totally off, the whole distribution is off and the uncertainty is off as well. And so all that is to say, we eventually realized that we cannot rely on this. We do want it to be as good as possible because to the extent it's good, it's going to be very useful, but it's not sufficient for us to actually tackle this problem. And the way we came to understand this is by doing uh, experiments with the GFP data and David would ran this algorithm. He's like, this is giving me back sequences that like, I'm no protein expert, but I'm pretty sure these are complete garbage. It's gone off in the crazy part of the space and like, this doesn't work. And so that's how we came to write the ICML paper. But so, but let me explain like what can go wrong, right? And I, I like to bring in this analogy of sort of the known pathologies that you usually see with respect to adversarial learning and machine learning. 
And they're nice because in my mind, these examples demonstrate that neural networks with state-of-the-art performance have these kind of black holes where they don't know what's going on, like these huge blind spots, right? So you may have seen these, perhaps if you saw them put them in a class you took, or maybe you saw them somewhere else, but here's an example where you have a neural network. And again, these are like, this is, these have happened on state-of-the-art um, models. People are trying to figure out different ways to fix this problem, but it really does show you something kind of fundamentally broken with neural networks, despite that they've changed the world. So you take this and it gets classified as a stop sign. So it turns out with a small gradient step in the right direction that is pretty easy to figure out, um, you can imperceptibly change that picture and make it get classified as almost anything you want, according to that model, like a yield sign or something, even though like you, for, for you and I, it looks the same. Um, that's a, I, I wouldn't, let's not worry about this one. Here's another example where like all these, yet like using a similar um, adversarial technique, all these yellow boxes are classified as an airplane with greater than 50% probability. Right? So like, this is just what this means is like neural networks. If you take them in, into other parts of the space that they're not used to, they are just complete garbage. And if you think about the design problem and the algorithm I described, unlike standard machine learning, we're purposefully pushing it into like weird parts of the space because we're trying to explore. And it's different than Bayesian optimization because we don't get to self-correct by collecting new data. So we're just stuck with this thing that's potentially very wrong in certain places. Of course, we can collect new data, but at some point we're gonna lock down the data and be faced with this problem. Okay, so, um, and it's interesting because it also does have a relevance to sort of, um, you can see this happening, what I described about how David found this crazy protein. So in fact, people have seen this um, with bananas, right? So what they do sometimes is they say, they're not trying to do protein design. They say, I've trained a really amazing neural network. I want to know what it sees. What does this thing see? So what they do is they have all these classes. They set the banana property to one. They set the other things to zero. And then they start with a random image and they use an iterative gradient optimization to get the input and say, tell me what a banana looks like. So this is what the banana looks like. Now, if you do that with a protein, like this is just gobbledygook nonsense, right? So again, this is just an illustration that where you can see it concretely with an image and this is just complete garbage. Um, and so that's the problem. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back to our modeling goals and we're gonna keep all the ones we had and we're gonna add one in, which is to account for the fact that the Oracle may be arbitrarily kind of biased or pathological in parts of the space. And so I'll be upfront, this is essentially an unsolvable problem. Like we can never get an exactly correct um, way to handle this. And so the question is, how can we do something such that we can still make progress in this area? And in some sense, those are always the most interesting problems, even if they're not amenable to theory. Um, and so we're gonna add that in. And so there's different ways you can think about this. And actually we're, we're thinking, uh, I don't have all of our latest thinking in here, but here's like one rough way to think about it is imagine someone gave me, um, imagine that I knew the training data that that Oracle was trained on. So, and, and here it's nicely depicted in a, in a square, but it need not be. And these were the inputs, like in this case molecules that I trained the Oracle with. Then basically what I can say is to the extent that I'm somehow similar to these molecules, according to say like a probability distribution, then maybe I trust the model. And as I kind of veer away from that, perhaps I trust it less. I think that's like a pretty sensible um, thing to do actually. Like, and, and probably you won't go wrong with that, only that it might perhaps be too conservative. And so, but the real, like, so sort of that, just to step back the, at the very abstract level, what you're trying to do is define a region according to a density P of X that you find that you think is trustworthy. And you can do this um, in an empirical way based on a set of samples. You can do it using auxiliary knowledge, um, or you could do it with implicit knowledge. So for example, you could take all sequences known to fold and build a density on them. So you don't know why they're folding, but you can try to kind of implicitly extract that by building a density model. And so that's kind of the layer on top of everything that I've told you that we're gonna add in here. Um, and so, uh, right, and so one is if you had access to the data, you could model it, but I just suggested some other ways and probably in reality on a real problem, you pro this probably is something you wanna think about very, very carefully. And you probably wanna do it partly from auxiliary knowledge, partly using instances of things you think are believable and partly from the training data. Um, so I'm not gonna go, like in the interest of time, I'm not gonna 
maybe go through all the details, but let's just say what we can do is we can bring this density into the model-based optimization. And it's the reason I said that it's really nice we brought in the language of probability is because it's only because we did that that we can bring that in here. And so this is now a coherent framework with which to deal with this problem that wouldn't have otherwise existed. And again, that was unforeseen, but very um, lucky and I think quite elegant. Um, and so I'm not gonna I'll go through all the details, but I'll just say, we started with model-based optimization that looked like this before, and now we're actually gonna start off with something different. Um, although you can kind of um, go a bit between these two, but now we're just gonna, I'm not gonna go through all of it, but let me just say what happens is the final update, it's an iterative algorithm in both cases, and the only difference between the first algorithm and the second one, like other than that the derivation is completely different, but at the end of the day, like practically speaking, you just get a weight that's added into the Monte Carlo estimate that modulates each of the samples um, further. And it modulates it based on how far away its density is from the, the, from the density you trust. And so like this is, 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 this is the sort of technical um, description of what I, I already described is how much do I trust you rel like for where you are relative to what I trust. Um, and so I think, um, yeah, I feel like this is, has gone quite long, but like, so we, you can look if you care, like I, maybe I won't go through these, but there's, this is a toy illustrative example that's handcrafted, but real, um, uh, demonstrating that when you use this approach, uh, basically, I mean, I'll just maybe quickly go through. So the ground truth here is this blue and what you would, and the training data we have, we're only in this regime. So you can think of this as low fluorescence and the goal is to get to the high fluorescence at four where we've never been. And what this shows you is that, um, uh, that in this case, uh, if you were to follow uh, the Oracle and just go out, you'd go arbitrarily out here. Like you just follow this orange thing, the Oracle, and you'd end up out here, which would have, the, according to the ground truth, it would have no fluorescence, so you'd be screwed. Whereas if you use this approach we've described, um, and which uses P of X from the training data, then it reigns you in. And in this case, it, um, it takes you here, which is not the highest peak, but at least it's like at the right um, range and it doesn't let you go crazy. Um, and then in this case is another example where you have data uh, from, from all over. In this case, again, it, if you hadn't used this method and you just did the naive thing, it would take you, um, Actually, I'm a bit confused by this one. Sorry, David updated these. Now, this one doesn't make sense to me anymore. Uh, okay, let's just skip that. I will go look at it after. And so um, one thing just to note is that unlike standard machine learning, so, and then there's some other, you can drill in into the paper if you want. And I apologize that I'm not explaining this one. <laughs> Suddenly- there's a, there's a question. Um, yeah. Uh, so there's a question that um, from the Greta Naro lab. We have encountered a very similar nonsensical predictive proteins due to bias in the training data. If you add this concern of distance from training data, you risk greatly reducing the space that machine learning methods can explore. Yeah. Do you have a sense of how much this hurts you? Yeah, no, I think that's like exactly the right observation. And this is a, a delicate dance, if you will, of exploring as much as you can, but not so much that you, that you shoot yourself in the foot. And I think that getting that balance right is tricky and requires more study. And I think a lot of getting it to work in practice will be really um, thinking long and hard about P of X, right? And so, uh, and so people do this informally, like, like this um, in papers just saying, I will not let my protein go more than four mutations away from the wild type because I just don't believe that that's useful. And so people are already doing this and this is a, a more nuanced way to do it that allows us to bring in information in a more coherent framework. But it's absolutely right. It's to the extent you strain yourself in, you may not explore the space well. And so, yeah, uh, it, it is, there is a tension there. That, that and then the follow-up to that is how far, um, how many orders of magnitude of space can you explore above your training data Oracle covers? I think the question is asking, to what extent can you extrapolate beyond your training set? So this is something we are looking into. So it's really, what's really amazing to me is I never thought about extrapolation. When, when I got into this, I started to think, okay, what do the theoreticians think? Like there's generalization error, right? But let's say that's a bit different. So I went over to like Peter Bartlett's office when we first started this, where he's like a very theoretical machine learning guy. And I said, you know, tell me what you guys know about extrapolation. And and I was actually relieved from his answer because in my mind, extrapolation is not even well-defined. Um, and he said, 
what is extrapolation? And I felt very gratified. And you know, when you look in one dimension like this, it's pretty easy to say what I mean. Like it's like far away, you know, in this case, extrapolation means I'm far from these blue points. But now start going to like super, like high dimensions where you can't visualize it. What does it mean to be far? Like it's not just distance, like exactly, you know, what is it? And you could, you could argue it is something to do with the density and these things get used actually in like covariate shift adaptation um, and things like this. So, but it's not even crisply defined. And so these are problems we're starting to poke into and to try to understand better um, and to see what we can, like, how do you know what, like how far you can extrapolate, right? Yeah, it, these are really, really hard questions, but they're central to being able to make progress here. Um, so, and now I remember now that I've stared at this, the idea was that in this case, you have an oracle that, that will go crazy, right? Like if you follow this oracle, you're completely um, going to be messed up. And so you would end up out here and it's useless. With our method, you, get, you don't get the optimum, but you get something still like useful. Um, and in this case, the idea is that the oracle is useful. And, and whenever you develop a method, you want to make sure that even if you didn't need that special method, you don't hurt yourself. And that's what this one is. It's saying that in this case, if you followed the oracle, you would end up here. But even with our model, you end up here. So it doesn't hurt you any. That, that's the point now. Um, OK. So right, and a really tricky thing here is to figure out how, how to assess. Like you, des you, you develop some method here. And unlike regular predictive models in machine learning, you can't just hold out part of the data and then say, how well did I do on it? because you've never seen the data um, for where you're trying to go and you don't actually really know how to trust it. So you, in, in terms of just convincing yourself computationally without going to the wet lab, but you have to go through quite some loops, um, some hoops and, and like do crazy stuff. Like for example, in this case, we had to, uh, I think I have it on a slide here, but we, we simulated a ground truth based on real data from GFP fluorescence. So we built a Gaussian process um, function with a particular um, protein string kernel, and we pretended that that was the ground truth. Then we sampled from that as though we had generated stuff like from in a lab, let's say, with some noise, and those are those blue points. And then from those points, then we build an oracle that is a different parametric form, actually, purposely. And so, the, and so this is right, like you can see there's kind of layers of stuff on here, and, uh, and it's, it's actually very tricky to convince yourself you've done something useful, but all that, it, so I just wanna, and, and I like to highlight this because there's actually a lot of papers out there where they ignore this issue altogether and they basically evaluate themselves on how well the Oracle is performing. They say, oh, well, this optimization gave a better Oracle value, but it's like, who cares? Because your Oracle is probably wrong. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm gonna just stop there in the interest of time. There's some more experiments comparing to other baselines that mo more or less we made up, um, not all of them, um, but, uh, I th and I think I'll just, yeah, I'll just stop there um, and just say like, basically we've introduced this framework for thinking about um, protein design, um, given some data using model-based optimization and shown kind of what can go wrong, ways to formally think about how to prevent that. Um, there's still a lot of room for um, to do things well here. And as we de delve deeper into these collaborations, um, which we're very serious about doing, I'm pretty sure we're gonna find more interesting problems, hopefully some successes and, um, and see what happens. So um, I'll stop there. Yeah, I think I'll just stop there because we're hey, out of time. Any, uh, any, any last questions from the audience? Yes, question. Uh, sorry, I have a question about the uh, the algorithm, the the DBAS algorithm, mm -hmm. and uh, the the uh, the slides mention the covariance matrix uh, adaptation evaluation strategy, and yeah. I hear that uh, the this strategy is uh, issue it, it needs a, a multivariate Gaussian uh, as a generating model. So uh, DBY. Right. DBY is don't uh, don't have this yeah right right Co so covariance matrix adaptation is a particular instance of a class of algorithms called estimation of distribution algorithms and it's the particular class where that search model is a Gaussian with a low typically a low rank covariance matrix and then there's a whole bunch of secret sauce they have on top of it. Um, uh, but it follows that. So it is. So that's why there's a link. To, there is a very tight algorithmic link 
although we don't use a Gaussian search model, we use a VAE. But algorithmically, there's a striking similarity between these. Okay, thank you. I have a quick question. So mm -hmm. if I put on my uh, Bayesian optimization hat, I can say something like, this looks like it could be a subroutine to Bayesian optimization yes, where actually, I can actually yeah. have a wet lab experiment at the outer loop. Yeah, yeah. so actually Mark Desenroth, um, who I think has moved to, he's somewhere in, the, in London now, I think he recently moved to institutions. And as far as I know, he's one of the very few people who does Bayes, Bayesian optimization where he says, so like the game in Bayesian optimization is like which acquisition function kind of to use, right? And then and that seems to be like a lot of the, I don't work in that area, but a lot of it is like crafting an acquisition function, showing some properties about it perhaps theoretically, and then running experiments and showing that that one works. And what, and what Mark pointed out uh, is that that optimization of the acquisition function is a super hard problem that people don't pay any attention to. And in fact, he has a paper where he uses techniques much like what I described to solve the inner optimization loop. And on top of it, he brings in properties like um, submodularity to show instances where you can do things in a um, particularly provably optimal manner that they don't apply to us, those things. But so absolutely, you can use this kind of stuff inside of there. And I believe Kevin Murphy has been exploring this kind of space as well. These, um, and, and in your collaborations, how realistic is that? Because part of the, I guess, the motivation for your work is that you, you don't want to have this iterative wet lab uh, well, necessarily. You don't yeah. necessarily want that. I think in general, our collaborators all want that because it's the only way they know how to do it. So in some sense, it's an opportunity for us because we get to do look at it both ways. We get to actually help dictate the data set that then actually gets locked down and then turns into this problem when it's locked down, right? So we kind of get the opportunity to do, like, I guess you could say in this case, we said, uh, we assume someone gives us the model, but in some sense, often we have an opportunity to generate the data that that, that gets to be used for that model. And it's also a pretty interesting question. Like, so there, yeah, there's so many interesting problems off of this, but like, imagine that you use, um, some procedure over rounds to generate the data. Like, how should you, are those data IID? And like, and how should you think of building a model from all of those data and things like this? Yes, that's interesting. And um, yeah, so, but, but the starting point was to say the data are locked down, but I think there's lots of interplay between these problems. And so I think actually, if I'd gone forward, I had something about, um, oh, these are the two here, I guess, if you have the slides, these are the two papers on uncertainty calibration that we were spending a lot of time looking at. Um, and then, right, as I wrote here, there's connections to Bayesian optimization and bandits um, and sequential design and all of this stuff. So I think like all of that stuff is going to be relevant. And um, we just started to think of it in this way. Okay. Um, Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, uh, it's been just yeah, really great to learn about all these collaborations and the applications to real biochemistry applications. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. I hope you're all doing okay sheltering at home. Um, must be boring to log in every week like this, but uh, all right. Bye, everyone.